Um, well, we have a short video to start. This was um, a round-the-world circumnavigation record uh, via the North Pole and the South Pole. It was a record that uh, had stood since 2008, and we thought there was a good chance with a G650ER that we could beat that record. So we set out from Cape Canaveral over the North Pole, South Pole, back to the same point. And this is a, a short video about it. Okay. All right, here we go. No. Can you play the video? This We're trying to set a world record. It's the so fastest it's time ever to go from one place on the Earth over both poles and back to the same point on the Earth, all in under 48 hours. Calling themselves one more orbit, their goal is to complete the fastest circumnavigation of the Earth via the North and South Poles in a business jet. And they're live streaming the whole thing. We need to go far and fast. And to fly around the Earth is a major undertaking. It's not something you can do by yourself. What we were achieving was something that has never been achieved before. The real challenge is making sure the refuels work very, very quickly. The pit stops. You could lose a huge amount of time if your right. refuel was too slow. There are no divert airfields in Antarctica in the midwinter. Is this mission so important to me that I am happy to risk my life? One hour! One hour to take off! And I'm such a tech nerd that yes, yes it is. One of the problems with being an astronaut is that your bucket list gets too long, and there are so many beautiful places on the planet that you want to see. This is a beautiful business jet, except normally you don't live in an airplane. Do you remember when they got ice cream on board the SS? Yes. We chose the Kennedy Space Center as the location for our launch, where Apollo left from 50 years ago. I didn't even know satellites could do this. I figured you must have some engineer and some really good technical people even to make the Wi-Fi work. <laughs> Gulfstream G650ER is not going to slow down for anybody. Okay, so this guy is going to catch him up. Yanka and Randall are probably the only two living females on the planet that have circumnavigated the poles. Great. So that's a, a great video that Terry um, directed. Hamish, where did you get the idea from of going for this world record? Um, well, because I fly the G650 myself, it's, uh, it's an aircraft that I wanted to do the record in, and uh, I saw it uh, as a time that we could have beaten, so uh, we, we went for it. And can, how easy would it be for someone else to come and have another go at it? Oh, impossible. Nobody could ever do that. No, no chance. No chance. Please don't try. <laughs> It's going to be hard to beat. I mean, you know, the, we were at 0.9 probably or faster the whole time. The pit stops were very fast. Everything went well. And that's going to be a tough record to beat until that supersonic business jet comes online, I think. You also had the advantage of uh, being able to go through Russian airspace faster. <laughs> we because did. You... <laughs> we did, yeah. The Gennady Padalka that you saw is a Russian cosmonaut friend of mine. And it, they were going to vector us all across Russia. And they... We told them that, hey, we have, we're going to pick up Gennady, and he's a hero of Russia, and they gave us direct across the whole country. So that helped the time a little bit. <laughs> okay, we, we've got a very cynical question from the audience. This comes after a panel on how we don't want to impact the climate. <laughs> Flying around the world for no reason at all. <laughs> you want to show the video? Um, well, actually, that, that segues very nicely yeah. into the next bit. Uh, we, we became very aware of carbon offset uh, through this program because uh, we were live streaming it around the world, so we had a lot of coverage. Um, and Yannicka in the audience did a fantastic job of live streaming it with Inmarsat and Satcom Direct. And that brought a lot of coverage of what we were doing. So we did fully offset the program. In fact, it was carbon negative. We did more than offsetting. And that got us right into the... Uh, the soil carbon offsetting, which was mentioned in the previous panel, and uh, we, we have actually got some material on that now in a short video. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. Hamish, a couple years ago when we first started talking about this project, he wanted me to be one of the pilots, and uh, I, was, I had a training class set up at Gulfstream, and 
Uh, it ended up getting delayed, and a few years later, by the time uh, this project happened, it was too late for me to get the training, so he said, well, why don't you make a movie? So I got to direct this documentary about it. There's a full-length documentary, and the drama of setting the record was part of the documentary, but the real point was how Apollo brought the world together and exploration can be a uniting force in the world where everything seems to be dividing nowadays. And the other big point of the movie was the climate. So we have a short clip actually from the movie of an organization called the Climate Underground. This is, this is a perfect panel to follow. Um, and I'll show you that. It's the next slide, I think. There we go. One More Orbit is a new type of exploration. Our team knew we had to counteract the environmental impact of this mission. So we teamed up with the Carbon Underground, an organization working towards a solution to reduce carbon in the atmosphere by restoring our soil and ecosystem. You can see that there's a problem that needs to be solved. How do you guys help with that problem of climate change? Well, let's start with our name, Carbon, carbon underground. underground. The Carbon Underground, our, our entire mission is to take carbon, the legacy carbon up in the atmosphere that we've put up there over the last really 100, 150 years at scale, and take that carbon and put it back in the ground where it came from. Throughout the Earth's history, we've had 15 times as much carbon right. in the atmosphere as we have now that's right. causing problems. Right. And every time nature was able to deal with it. Right. How did it do it? Well, it did it by using something that we all learned about in third grade called photosynthesis, right. right? Carbon is taken by these plants and the plant takes what they want and the rest of it goes down into the soil to feed the microorganisms. Right. So every, every teaspoon of healthy soil, if it's healthy, there are about 7 billion living things in it. 20,000 to 100,000 species. Think about that for a and second. And they're all hungry. They're all hungry, and you know what they want? Carbon. When you grow food, and this is really about how we grow food, when you grow food in a way that fights nature, as opposed to works with nature, and we kill that soil and we kill those microorganisms, what nature says is, well, there's nobody demanding this carbon. Right. So I'm gonna leave it up there. If you think about it, the real reason we have climate change is we have shut down nature's own tool to deal with it. The natural regulation by managing our soil use, not monocropping or using chemicals and not tilling the soil, we can bring down exponentially more carbon back into the ground where it belongs. To draw that legacy carbon back down while we are also reducing emissions. Right. If we only reduce emissions, it's gonna be brutal quickly. One More Orbit is a race against time to break this record. And our climate is also a race against time. Right. We're doing a race to save the planet. Mm -hmm. We can quantify per acre how much carbon's gonna come down and we can literally take your mission from adding carbon to being carbon neutral to actually being carbon negative and helping reverse climate change. We can fix there, this. There's hope. Oh my gosh, I mean, we're literally right. growing hope. So I wanna jump in real quick here. Um, the point that Larry's making of going carbon positive to carbon negative, uh, he has a great analogy. Imagine that you're this big 400 pound guy and you've got diabetes and you've got a heart attack and you go to the doctor. Um, it's similar to the number, about 420, I think, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It used to be 280. So we've gone from 280 to 420 during the industrial period. And, the, and we're adding about five per year. So when you go to the doctor with, with this massive overweight problem, he's not gonna tell you, well, just start gaining two pounds per year. That's my plan for you. You know, he's gonna tell you to lose weight. And that's where this idea of trying, reducing emissions is important, um, but actually going carbon negative uh, is even more important. This organization calls it um, carbon insetting rather than offsetting. So it's more than, they're trying to do more than just stopping the problem from growing. They're trying to actually, you know, bring the carbon number down. Hamish, when you would, so the carbon, you wanted to, to highlight carbon offsetting, but you guys also wanted to try and energize young people yeah. into, and do you feel that, you know, that we're seeing, 
a lot of headlines, you know, very negative headlines at the moment, and a lot of campaigners. Do you feel that aviation is less attractive to younger people? Admittedly, most want to become professional Fortnite players, but do you see this as a, as a real worry? Yeah, we, we did want to make it uh, something exciting to watch, and um, we did have a lot of schools tuning in. We did a lot of schools panels, and they all talked to Terry, particularly as an astronaut. That was very interesting, and uh, but actually, a lot of the uh, live stream was dominated by chat from flat earthers. Actually, who took over initially, and uh, I am very interested to meet some flat earthers. I would be fascinated to understand them. You, you find them all around the globe. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably you also get the people who don't believe that man's been in space as well, so it's, it's, you get double. I was brought, I came over here about a year ago to be on Good Morning Britain. Um, I was actually on right after Nigel Farage. I didn't know who it was and everyone was like, that's Nigel Farage. I'm like, who's that? Um, and all they wanted to talk about was Flat Earth. I'm like, I flew all the way to London to be on the morning TV show and they wanted to talk about the Flat Earth. Yeah. I went. Uh, it was interesting though the, the, to see the Jets' performance going over the pole. I had never been over, in an airplane over either. I don't think anybody had, and the navigation system worked pretty amazingly well. Side topic. Um, but how can people in the street, what's your next project to, to energize? Uh, I'm doing a lot in Antarctica at the moment. We've uh, got a lot of uh, tourist travel going to Antarctica. We supply the aviation resources um, into Antarctica to a friend of mine, Patrick Woodhead, who owns Flight White Desert and uh, just been down in Antarctica in January, which is quite fun. And um, we're doing a lot, of, lot more ecotourism in Antarctica. And uh, you go in by a Gulf Stream from Cape Town, and you actually see some of the uh, warming that's going on in the planet. There's ice runways in Antarctica that are actually melting now in January, the hottest time of the year, which were not 10 years ago. OK, I, I want to spare the person in the audience from having to type, but how can you do ecotourism <laughs> flying in a Gulf Stream to Antarctica. Well, that's where this, I mean, this idea of, of actually, the reality is our mission actually took carbon out of the atmosphere just because of the, it was a, there was a monetary cost for that. You have to pay for the, um, the soil management program that they have. And then it'll take, I think Larry estimates two to three years for that number to be break even. And then after that, it's all ultimately negative. And some from the audience is going, they just want to clear up. So you're offsetting, you bought acres of, 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 of the ground that will then be farmed or? Well, he, the way they do land management, so it's a lot of farming. Actually, his organization just did a deal with the government of Thailand, the whole country is gonna change how they do farming. So it's uh, more land management, mostly farming, some forests, yeah. Okay, and being cynical again, how hard was it actually flying around the world in a large cabin business jet. <laughs> so, my, I've seen the video, you were being catered for really well. Yeah, so my buddies gave me a lot of shit about that. And, uh, <laughs> and you know what, we, so I was like, all right, are we gonna make it look like we're mushing dogs to the South Pole? And no, we didn't. I were like, we're here in a business jet. But it was also 48 hours and you know, it was, in some ways it was like being in space. It's a nice place, but you're in this cramped area with the same people, so. It, it was not, we didn't lose a lot of weight, but it was, you know, it was also 48 hours without sleep, so. Hey, Mish, how, how, you were flying some of it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a, a, a series of plans on how to uh, sleep manage, and uh, we were, uh, there were four of us flying, and two crew on, two crew off. And, uh, but so we didn't really get a lot of rest at the end. There was a lot of uh, interviews with Anderson Cooper, or schools interviews, or just the general adrenaline. So most, most of it was awake for the 48 hours. There was some drama too. I mean, over Antarctica, the temperature got below aircraft limits and the fuel was not a lot. It was, there was some drama in it. You gotta watch the movie to see all the, all the fun stuff. Uh -huh. uh, um, okay, another cynical question. So technically, if you've just bought the soil, you haven't offset the trip yet. It's coming. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, um, any other questions from the room? Yes. A um, bit of an inside question. I'm the payload specialist on board. Um, but I think the important point is that we are in the corporate jet and business jet industry. And the key is business. So we need these jets because um, 
when we work in business, we have to get from A to B as quickly as possible, and we can't do regular jet flights because we can't meet our meetings in time. We have to be there in person. We don't have a hologram that can be there for us. We need face-to-face -face communication in order to make corporate deals. And the thing is that we also need GPS. Now, how do the GPS, how do we get that? We get that via satellite. How do we get the satellites into space? We get it by using rockets that need rocket fuel, and therefore we need, uh, we need fossil fuels. There's no way about it. We have to rely on fossil fuel in order to do a long distance flight and to launch rockets. So, any comments? No, I mean, that's, it, it's easy to say we should just stop using fossil fuels and then we would all starve to death. It would, obviously, that's not what you want to do for the world's economy. So the point is, you, we have this resource. Let's try not to use too much of it and save some for our grandkids and then uh, use it in a way that does not damage the planet anymore. And that, that was a big message, message of you know, the film and the project that we did. To, it's just not possible to stop using all fossil fuels. That's not... That's one way to make humans miserable, you know. <laughs> That's not what we want to do. A question from Leo Knappen from Bombardier. Thank you. Actually, it's a follow-on question because uh, the lady was saying fossil fuel. So uh, this goes back to the other panel. Why did you consider, and if you did, why did you dismiss not using sustainable aviation fuel? So Boeing has proven and uh, to the regulators that we could do this at 50-50 blend. So why didn't you use a 50-50 or 40-60 or 30-70 or blend? Why only jet fuel, kerosene? That, that's a good question. Um, it was Qatar executive who were actually uh, operating the aircraft we used for this record. And uh, I'm not sure what their policy is on this at the moment. but. Uh, we, we look at the economics, including in that last panel just now, where you've got, um, say, uh, sustainable jet fuel costing about, what, $12, $15 a gallon. So the price becomes very high at the moment, whereas offsetting is like 5% of the cost of the fuel at the moment. We, we can do this offsetting for, um, we are actually at about $50 per tonne of carbon, uh, which was... Uh, the sort of paradigm that was mentioned on the previous panel, that is exactly what, what we, were, we were paying to do the soil offsetting. And that's sort of 5% of the fuel cost, whereas uh, the other method is uh, sort of 2 or 300% of, of the fuel cost. And I guess, I guess the other issue is you refueled in Mauritius, Astana. Yeah, they have it, yeah. Yeah, and Tierra de Fuego. Yeah. And so, uh, Kennedy. That is true. Um, any more questions? Okay, final question. You've inspired everyone in the room to go and break a record in a business jet. What would you suggest? What record to take next? Yeah. We've been talking about that. Come on, you've been talking about it. Don't be shy, Hamish. <laughs> So that's a good question. Last night we were having this discussion. There's like how many countries you can go to in one day. And I think the record's 21 from what we were talking about. So um, that would be, and that would only be 24 hours. So it'd be less painful than this 46 and a half hour flight. Um, we've talked about it. The, out, the Qatar folks were like, all right, what record are we going to do next? So if you've got any ideas, let us know. The only, the, the only one I can think about is David Boone's one on the most cans of Foster's drunk flying from London to Australia, uh, which was an Australian cricket team record, I believe. Uh, thank you. With that note, I'd like to invite you all to join us for fair trade coffee. Uh, soya milk is available. Thank you very much.